people missing and we're now recording so stop talking about her that way uh, <laughs> i believe the official statement was yes we are going to be in complete compliance with all of the building codes that we can comply with everything is going to be legalized to the max there you go <laughs> Uh, lesson 16 as we finish up tonight and again we're going to move through pretty quick and there are going to be some things that we move we either skip over completely or just move through really fast and quite frankly lessons 23 and 24 which are review and conclusion uh, we're just leaving those out completely so if I don't even mention them again please don't be offended um, As we move on, lesson 16 about grace. Um, the covenant relationship believers enjoy with God is not earned, only accepted. It's granted from the nature of God's own character. Um, acceptance involves participating in covenant life and mission, taking up the cross and making disciples of all nations. The Hebrew terms translated grace and mercy in English are most often identical, um, just a translator's choice. Although they are different terms in Greek, their meanings overlap considerably because of the influence of the Old Testament. As the strong one, uh, remember the, the big king implements the covenant and the little king accepts it. Um, as the strong one, God voluntarily comes to the aid of the weak. His help is an undeserved gift or favor, benevolence, condescension. The gift may take the form of forgiveness, a restored relationship, a friendship, love and acceptance, time to repent, a mission, a work to do, or in the wherewithal to do it. Salvation, healing, blessing, power to act, care, etc. The supreme expression of the grace of God is the gift of himself, the gift of his son and of his spirit. All that is required of the recipient of grace is the necessary humility and willingness to receive the gift. Faith. But faith in God is not simply believing that he exists. Openness to God and dependence on him are necessary prerequisites of faith. Faith means trust in and loyalty to God. I, I just, over and over again in teaching and preaching, I find the word faith in the Bible. And I, I say, and the best word in modern English to translate this is trust. It's trust. Um, and I developed that conviction studying Greek at the undergraduate level, and it stuck with me through the graduate level and Hebrew studies and everything, I just am convinced that the best modern English word to translate the, the words in the Bible that are generally translated faith is trust. And I like this expansion, trust in and loyalty to God. Uh, but as a response to grace, faith and obedience to God are both merely tangible expressions of gratitude. Um, I'll just go back and remind you that um, we are Westlands, and so we believe in the doctrine of provenient grace, the grace that goes before salvation. And, and this idea of acceptance, I'm, I'm just a brief mention, but the idea of our accepting God's gift of grace, God's gift of a relationship, God's gift of forgiveness and salvation, um, that acceptance must never be understood as a qualifying work, okay? Did that communicate, do you understand when I say a qualifying work, it's not something we do in and of our own strength that makes us worthy or qualifies us to be recipient. We, there's, there can be no hint in your good theology of the idea that we do anything to merit or earn God's favor. Even our trust faith response is properly understood as a gift of God through the provenient grace and operation of his Holy Spirit 
prior to our being saved. That God actually comes to us and makes it possible for us to hear and receive and accept the grace that he offers. And it just so happens that that is a general gift um, spread abroad on all flesh, right? Um, that gift of provenient grace, we believe, is given to every human being, which is one of the reasons why um, many Wesleyan scholars and theologians are reluctant to use the term total depravity, even though we do think that if you could ever meet a human being who was in their totally natural fallen state, you would meet a totally depraved being. Uh, the problem logically is, or in reality, maybe I should say is, there is no such thing as a human being that is totally in their natural fallen state apart from the prevening grace of God. We believe that in some measure, you can think of it as a small measure, although again, wherever God shows up, all of God shows up. Uh, maybe undeveloped measure is the better way to think about it, but that that prevening grace is mitigating depravity everywhere you find the human condition. In every human being, the prevenient grace of God is at work mitigating the total depravity of the fallen human nature and making it possible for us to both receive and respond to the grace of God. That doctrine, I mean, I just, I know I've harped on it a few times and I harp on it in investigating Christian theology. It's got to be harped on because it keeps us from being heretics. It keeps us from being Pelagian and working up some sort of however minimal it would be understanding that our response or our faith or our request for forgiveness is a meritorious work that earns God's favor. Even at the smallest degree, that would be wrong. Grace is a free gift. We accept it and we accept it, quite frankly, in the power of the spirit that's in us before we've even been saved. Because of the prevenient grace of God. Some people don't really like hearing all that spirit talk, but that's the active agent of God in the world. The agent of prevenient grace is the Holy Spirit. And so it's right to understand the Holy Spirit's at work before the gospel has been accepted. And think about the implications that that has for how we do evangelism, what we, our mindset when we go and we evangelize somebody. I mean, Steve, you understand, I think, almost intuitively from the jail ministry, you've never come across someone in the jail ministry or right out of jail or in addiction recovery. You just never come across somebody where God wasn't already at work in their life. Maybe to a lesser extent, but he's there. He's already laid the groundwork before you got there. And I just, that's important to understand, especially within the doctrine of grace, God's at work. We were, um, we were talking last night in our meeting and we were talking about being stagnant. And one of the things I said is by ignoring what we learn of the spirit, God, you become, st if you become, and you become stagnant, you're going to return to your old ways. And the scripture was Roman eight, six, Romans eight, six. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Right. And, you know, you, you compare that to any of the literature that they get in their recovery or anything else. It all says the same thing. It says it in different words, but it puts it right out there to them. Yeah. You mentioned recovery. I've had this conversation many times with our um, founding director of the Murray County Prevention Coalition and um, she's run across it and I knew that she would um, from my past experience, which is not super deep, but my past experience with folks in the recovery work. Okay, the professionals, and especially in the mental health professionals that are kind of professionally in the recovery industry. Yep. 
And I've said several things there that ought to throw red flags up for people. The recovery industry, because it indeed is an industry. It's business. Right? It's business. That's exactly right. Um, and the one thing that she's encountered and I knew she would, and like I said, we talked about it beforehand and we've had several talks about it since is within the recovery community, um, especially within the healthcare sector, mental health care sector around recovery, there is an absolute aversion to using the word recovered. Um, over and over again, it's I am in recovery. I'm in long term recovery. And um, I just, I mean, I, there's a part of me that goes, I understand the science. I understand how opioids rewrite the neural pathways and change the brain chemistry. Um, and then there's a part of me that goes, but I am absolutely convinced through and through of the doctrine of regeneration. That God through the power of the Holy Spirit has the ability to create a new creature when a person turns to him for salvation and that that new person can through the persistent cooperation with the Holy Spirit be so renewed in body mind and spirit that they are truly a recovered addict they are no longer an addict they no longer fight that addiction I mean I Steve I'm sure you've known people who I'm like I'm talking about that they're beyond that now. They've well, they've I've been a creature. I've been in for 13 years. Joe's been sober for 23 years, and we, you know, I, I believe that I've recovered from my addiction, but I always want to say I'm in recovery because I want to make sure that in my mind, I still got to keep working on me because. For a guy that's had that disease and that affliction, it's a very dangerous place for them to be that think they got it all together now because they'll think, well, I can go out and do that now and I can do it socially. Yeah, no. and I, <laughs> that's why we, that's, that's one of the big reasons we say we're always in recovery. Right. Well, and, you know, and the, it's the same problem that, frankly, I have with, uh, with the song, I'm Just a Sinner Saved by Grace. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, theologically, I have a lot of trouble with that song because once I was truly saved, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm no longer a child of damnation. I am a child of the king adopted in the family of God. I am a new creature. Mm -hmm. Right. Behold, all things have become new. And that's the power of the doctrine of regeneration. It's not that we can't ever sin again. We don't believe that post entire sanctification. A person can. I mean, we don't lose our ability to sin. We don't lose our ability to choose something other than the will of God ever until glory. And then I think, you know, one can have a like nice long logical argument about whether you still could or not, but you won't because you ain't going to be stupid no more. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a part of me that goes a perfected human nature that knows good and evil and has that memory as part of their their being is is only going to be drawn toward God more and more for eternity, you know, and uh, so there there we go. Just the whole deal about grace, but I, I don't I don't ever want us to forget within the Wesleyan understanding. The doctrine of regeneration is huge. New creature, new creation. Uh, the, the, the new man is a real thing. Or the new woman is a new thing, right? Um, we are recreated in his image to do the good works that he prepared for us ahead of time. That we should walk therein. That's just, that, that's why we, that, that's just how it works. I mean, that's, that's what we believe. Well, if you're trying to walk in the in the light of in the light and not in the darkness anymore, I really believe that you try to walk in the light. Yeah, you do. You make a lot more effort at walking in the light, and a lot less effort has to be made to stay away from the darkness. Oh, okay. you've done it. <laughs> there, there's just a part of me that goes, your whole 
if you think about your the way you started this comment about stagnation, mm-hmm. um, we are. I think about it this way: we we live upstream in a downstream world. God's upstream, and we're in a canoe. If you've ever been in a fast-flowing stream in a canoe, you either paddle and move forward, or you lose ground. Yep. You paddle the same speed as the current, you're going with the flow downstream. Yep. So you got to be, there is progress. You got to keep moving toward God. But the other thing I'd say is there, there is truth in the idea that as long as you are moving toward God, you don't have to exert effort not to go the other way, right? You, 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 every day you move closer to God, and that's your intention, and that's your effort, and that's your movement. You're moving away from evil by moving toward God. Right. You really don't have to give a whole lot of brain time to I'm I'm quitting. I'm not. I'm you know. It's just I'm doing I'm doing God's thing now, and there's not time for anything else. Mm-hmm. Find yourself so busy doing good that you don't have time to even try not to do evil because you don't have time to do evil. <laughs> This is true. Well, let's uh, push on past grace, which we understand is freely given and freely received. And along with that, we mentioned it last week, um, our forgiveness is freely given, freely received, and we must become forgiving people um the the parable of the unforgiving servant is key um i think both to understanding the freedom of grace um and the responsibility of the believer who has received that free gift of grace to then be a gracious giver of both the forgiveness that they've received and of the grace they've received In chapter 17, we turn to the idea of biblical ethics. Um, Questions like, how does one distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, better and best? Uh, Practices on a biblical basis. Um, Within the scripture itself, proper and improper relationships to God and idols proper and improper relationships between men and women and between persons are and possessions those are the three most prevalent topics throughout scripture there's some part of me that goes um, i'm really tired of hearing all of the discussion about homosexuality because i just don't know that I, i think there's more important stuff for the church to kind of preach and teach about but the the other piece of that truth is um, that these three topics proper and improper relationships to god and idols um, between men and women and between persons and possessions are the three most prevalent topics throughout scripture so it appears to me that it matters a lot to god how we are related to other people and our proper relationships with other people as well as between people in possessions and god and idols Um, and there is the uh within scripture the idea that there is propriety and observance of propriety is essential to overcoming the greatest threat to having the greatest satisfaction you can in life um, and that's good relationships. Right? I, um, I don't want to get, ever get hung for saying things like this because, you know, just sometimes I say things like I see them. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, from what I've observed, the closest thing to hell on earth that you'll ever experience is to be locked in a bad marriage. And the closest thing to heaven on earth that you'll ever experience is being in a really good marriage. Strange how those two things kind of, but that's about relationship. And it it speaks, I think, to how important having good relationships, 
proper relationships are and go back to that fourfold relationship. It's one of the reasons why I say I could run through all of this stuff at the end so fast because we've been there. You know, what's God's perfect world is where all of our relationships are right. It's the shalom peace of the garden when they were naked and unashamed and everything was right between the man and his God, between the man and the woman, between the man and himself and between the humans and their world, right? That fourfold peace, that fourfold right relationships of shalom. Um, the biblical foundations of Christian ethics raise several significant questions. Um, here's two, how are average Christians, um, whatever they are, um, I think by being a Christian, plain and true, you're above average. Um, might not be good looking, but you're above average. <laughs> How are average Christians who are not experts in biblical interpretation, theology, or ethics to appropriate the Bible as a significant resource in ethical discernment? It, it is a great question. Um, and the answer historically, especially for the Protestant movement, is we believe thinking, educated people, and by educated, I mean people who have enough education to read scripture um, and study it, will have the ability to use the truth found in scripture as a guide for how they should live. Not just a guide for how they might get saved, but a, a guide for how they should conduct their everyday lives and how they should live. Somewhere over in my stacks and stacks of books that I actually know where that one is. It's in a, a bin behind that monitor that you can't see off screen. Oh, did I freeze up there? No, there we go. Um, is a book entitled um, Business by the Good Book. And somebody has come up with a pretty cool little book and they've discerned a whole series of principles for conducting business from the Bible. And I'm not telling you you need to go run by that book or I endorse it greatly, but it, it just is one of a whole genre that examples how thinking, reading people, interpreting people have used the Bible as a basis for how they should govern their lives. And then how do we allow scripture to play a significant role in the moral decision making? Um, the role of the Bible in Christian ethics is ultimately um, and intimately related to the nature of biblical authority and the practice of biblical interpretation. And in particular, what people believe and think about the role of scripture. Um, we, Christians of the Wesleyan holiness tradition, in agreement with the church generally and broadly, and especially throughout time, accept the Bible not only as authoritative and normative for its faith, but also for its ethical practice. Uh, but it's far more difficult to describe how the Bible does or should function in this role um, than that it is asserted. Um, so let's talk a bit about the nature of biblical authority. Um, the authority of the Bible is derived, it's always, this is one of those things that's just important, that wherever you fall on the spectrum of inerrancy, whether you're, you know, just right in the middle there with the Nazarene doctrine of Scripture, and we say inerrant in all things necessary for salvation, um, or whether you slide more toward the total inerrancy, um, it's important to keep the Bible in its right place, and that is as derived authority. Um, the Bible is not the fourth member of the Holy Quartet. You get it? Um, unfortunately, I've heard Fortunately, they've all been on the radio or television. Um, but unfortunately, I've heard sermons 
where I believe you would have, if that was the only teaching that you ever got, you would, you would think that, you know, there was God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> and God better agree with the King James Version of the Bible or he might end up in hell. I mean, and I'm not being funny. I'm glad Steve's laughing because, but. I've, I've heard it too. Yeah. And, and I don't want, I don't want to hear Paul. The King James Bible was written by Paul. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what he preached from. Yeah. 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 Well, and I don't think we have to even go into that. I mean, obviously, that's just plain ignorance. And yeah. You don't know the difference between 1611 and the first century, you know, like 1600 years. I mean, and it's really hard. Um, anyway, my dad used to have a saying, and every once in a while, I just got to squeeze in one of my dad's saying. My dad had a saying, and that is, um, you can inform ignorance, but you can't fix stupid. And uh, I, I asked dad one time, what's the difference in ignorance and stupidity? And his answer was, stupid is failure to understand that your ignorance needs to be informed. <laughs> there's, there's pretty good wisdom in there, okay? I always want to. I always want to be in that position where I believe my ignorance should be informed. So I never end up in Dad's category of stupid. That was a bad place to be. But I'm, we're having some lightheartedness here, and that's good. But it's a serious thing um, how we deal with the Bible. We don't want to deal with it lightly. We don't want to end up with the Bible in a in a place where we don't take it seriously. We don't really believe in its authority, and order ourselves under its authority but it's also important to understand that it's a product of human writing human language and, and god's on his throne and the bible is an earthly creation we, we talked about this at the very beginning of class and so I'm not going to be it. but when we say in our article of faith plenary inspiration that idea of wholeness or fullness um, is not that you can bust the Bible up into all of its component parts and take three words out of the middle of it and say, that is the complete truth of God. It is the whole of the scripture, the whole of the biblical revelation. We say that the Bible is fully inspired and by that we mean in its wholeness it reveals to us the truth of God. Mm -hmm. um, Wesley was was so adamant that we had to take into account the whole tenor of Scripture. We had to basically let Scripture interpret Scripture, let Scripture inform our understanding of other Scriptures, and where one Scripture seems to contradict another Scripture, we got to go to the whole Bible. We got to read basically the whole thing and then figure out how did we misunderstand that so that we thought it was in conflict with this and if there was a conflict how do we reconcile it and typically that has to do uh, with general versus special circumstance you know is this a principle that's meant to apply to a special circumstance or a local circumstance or is it a general principle and there's nothing kind of worse than abstracting um, a general principle from what's meant to be a, a local injunction, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's clear that uh, Paul's instruction to Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake is not um, a scriptural uh, injunction to uh, just drink wine all the time. Hold on, I got to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to use that last week. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you, brother. You may have you may have, you have to remember that for the next week or two. I have to I have to use loopholes. <laughs> yeah. That's a specific injunction to a specific person at a specific time in history for a very specific reason and should not be understood as license generally. Um for the use or even abuse, certainly not the abuse, but I'd say it's not even to be understood as a license for using wine. Um, 
except in the case that maybe you have to have it for your stomach. Find yourself in the same circumstances as Timothy. It might be, it might pertain to you, right? There is a part of me that goes, if you're ever stuck somewhere in the tropic zone and you've got a bottle of wine and a creek running beside you, you should not drink the bottle of wine. Uh, certainly not straight, but you should use it as a uh, water purification agent. <laughs> Mix it about 10 to 1 with water, and you'll find that you can't get drunk, and it will kill the organisms in the water. Yes. You'll just swill it in and let it sit for a while. Um, interestingly enough, there's a, if you ever want to look it up, there's some really great articles, and there's a great article out there um, that Christianity Today published a long time ago. And I can't even tell you when they published it. I just know they published it maybe in the 80s, maybe in the late 70s. And it has to do with the biblical consumption of wine. And they did a lot of good research. And they speak to how wine was used in biblical times in the first century as a purification agent. And how it was mixed with water um, and generally highly diluted um, for normal consumption. So I'm not trying to make an argument sort of for or against because I'm a Nazarene and you know where I stand on that. Or if you don't, that means I'm a teetotaler. <laughs> but um, we'll move on. Um, it is important again. It's not the Holy Quartet, it's the Holy Trinity. And the Bible derives its authority from God and from its use within the church. Why is it that these 66 books are authoritative and other books are not that have been around uh, longer or at the same length of time and even uh, in widespread use in the church? Well, um, that's because over a long process, these are the books uh, that we, we as the church uh, have coalesced around as being authoritative for faith and practice and that's a beautiful story and it's not the one for this class just quite frankly i told you about that earlier and that um the story of the bible that uh, timothy luke johnson did with the learning company great courses it's just a great great someday when you're not having to pay and take courses and spend all your thursday nights listening to me listen to luke timothy johnson on the story of the bible and after you've done that 20-something hours of lectures, tell me if you think it was worth it, because I do think it's worth it. Um, God, that, that was the story of the Bible, you said? The story of the Bible by Luke Timothy Johnson, offered in the Great Courses series by the Learning Company. Get those on Amazon or through audible.com. Quite frankly, the best way to get them is through an audible.com subscription. Sorry, shameless plug for audible.com, now an Amazon company. Um, if you don't know about them, you need to know about them. I think that you pay, I forget what it is. Anyway, it's not super cheap, but if you're interested in those kind of courses, you could pick out four or five and then start comparing the cost. Yeah. And basically, if it costs you a couple hundred dollars a year to get 12 credits from audible.com, you could very easily triple or quadruple your money by getting uh, the great courses material through audible.com, uh, many of which are 50, 75, 100 plus dollars a course, um, and they'll cost you one credit via Audible. Okay. It's almost like you so could. That's the story of the Bible, Luke Timothy Johnson. That's it. Okay. And there are a bunch of other really good, good ones out there. Um, so. Um, while you're enrolled in the course of study, there's another shameless plug for our process. While you're enrolled in the course of study or a valid course of study, you're not required to do continuing education units. Um, you are actually instructed, uh, if you read the fine print on lifelong learning hours, that's learning.nazarene.org. Boy, I can just shamelessly plug these things over and over again. Um, as, as long as you are a student enrolled in a valid course of study for the ministry, um, all you have to do to be in compliance with your continuing education is make an entry 
in your own ledger at learning.nazarene.org and say enrolled in the ministerial course of study 20 hours. You just log 20 hours and move on. It's and you can dig around in the fine print and you can find that. So but anyway, as the district's continuing education coordinator person, I'm telling you that with some authority. Back to the authority of the Bible. God's self-communication, his effort to make himself known and his will uh, fully succeeded in accomplishing the purpose he had in mind. We affirm that this is true in what we believe about the Bible, even though um, we think there are inevitable limitations imposed upon him by the necessity, necessity of employing human language and by his choice to use human agents to execute the actual writing of Scripture. I think no matter what we believe about the Bible, no matter where on the spectrum you fall, uh, I think it's pretty easy to agree that God and God's authority and God's person ends up being bigger or smarter or more authoritative than the Bible itself. And someday in eternity, we'll absolutely know that. But the Bible has a unique significance for Christian ethical discourse. And I want to think carefully about these statements I'm about to make because they're going to distinguish us and they're going to protect us from some of the problems that are getting so much press in our world today, among other denominations. Christians rightly consider scripture the final authority for morality. Did you hear that? The final authority for morality. The content of Christian ethics is not always clearly distinguishable from that of non-Christian ethics. That statement means sometimes Christians and heathens agree about the right way we ought to conduct our lives. Um, the distinctive dimension is to be found in the ethical motivation and the source of its moral norms. Apart from the appeal to the authority of Scripture, it is debatable whether an ethic may be considered truly Christian. The problem remains as to how this authority actually functions. The Bible's authority is not absolute or exclusive. It has a necessary primacy among normative authorities. But it is not alone self-sufficient. Okay. Um, these are this is pretty careful wording. The Bible itself and church practice acknowledge other sources of ethical insight. Wesleyans in particular have been explicit about this, appealing to the quadrilateral, tradition, experience, and reason, as well as scripture, are sources of moral norms. And again, scripture is our source of all articles of faith. Among these four, scripture is the court of last appeal, the norming norm itself. But it is not always clear how the church should bring scriptural resources into dialogue with non-biblical sources of ethical insight while still maintaining theological and rational integrity. The Christian assertion of the primacy of scripture is a confessional stance, not one based on an empirical or objective evaluation. That is, the Bible cannot be proven to be the final authority in matters of ethics. Uh, the Christian claim is a matter of faith. Only a scripture actually functions authoritatively is Christian ethics Christian, right? It is a faith assertion. It is part of what we believe as Christians that the Bible should be normative in our formation of ethical and moral understanding, right? You're not going to just be able to somehow prove that. I have some great ideas around that, but it, at the end of the day, it's a faith assertion. Um, I once preached a sermon. I'm not telling you it was great. I'm just telling you I preached it once. And the title of the sermon was, Are you a Bible-believing Christian? Or are you a Christian who believes the Bible? We'll play on words there um, in which I basically said long before I believed in the Bible I was a Christian long before I had the mental and um, technical skills to read the Bible 
I had been introduced to Jesus. And by the way, all the illiterate, illiterate souls in the world that have ever been led to Jesus did that, okay? They got introduced to God through Jesus Christ and connected to God and saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And only secondarily, maybe they heard some Bible in there somewhere and they may never have been able to read it for themselves. There have been millions and millions and millions of Christians who could not read and yet who knew Jesus Christ deeply and who had been forgiven and saved. And we will see them in eternity and they will be our brothers and sisters. And my guess is if they want to, they'll be able to read them. They just won't have any use for it. <laughs> they can just ask the man. Um, it, we'll come back to that, that it's a, it is a big thing to say that we as Wesleyan Christians, um, boy, I wish we could say that about all Wesleyan Christians, but certainly the Nazareth Church, the, the thing that protects us uh, from what I see as the slide that has occurred, the thing that should protect us from the slide that's occurred in the United Methodist Church is that we embrace the Bible as the authority, not only for quote unquote faith, but for morality and ethics, right? And that we, we assert, we make the faith assertion that it, it is the normative source. It is the authority for how we should live our lives. Um, boy, I just can't hardly say enough about that. It is the authority for how we live our lives. Um, I think one has to be careful not to uh, be a proof texter uh, because a proof, proof texting, um, it doesn't mean you can't quote scripture and say this scripture says, and so I believe this, but you better make sure when you do that, that's what that scripture means and that it agrees with the whole tenor of scripture, right? The person that says, I'm murdering in the name of Jesus, Okay. I think that they probably can go somewhere and proof text their way into thinking that they're okay, but they haven't read the whole tenor of scripture. They haven't understood that the heart of God says you don't murder. All right. Now, I'm not saying that all forms of killing are murder, right? And, you, and just by that discussion, just that little little bit right there, we begin to understand that we have to have a fairly nuanced conversation when we start talking about morals and ethics, right? Because just because you someday have to use a firearm and you kill somebody with it, God forbid, and may it never happen, but just because that day comes doesn't make you a murderer. You may have acted in self-defense. You may have acted in defense of another. Um, that doesn't mean you won't have to live with it. But uh, there's a part of me that goes, I, I read the story about the church in Texas where the guy was walking through the pews, shooting babies and women and men in the congregation, right? And, and the question you really got to ask yourself is, do you want to be the preacher that pulled a weapon and shot that guy? Yeah. Or do you want to be the preacher that stood there and watched him shoot everybody? I'd pick number one. Well, maybe with you, brother. Mm -hmm. That's no easy answer any way you slice it. No, it's not. No easy answer. Um, chapter 17 ends this way. In one sense, every lesson in this module on biblical theology 
as more or less obvious ethical implications. The principles and examples suggested in this introduction to the biblical foundation for Christian ethics may serve as a launching pad for your own reflection on the imperatives implicit in the themes of biblical theology. That's just, there's a lot there. Um, but we should, this is just one we do, um, it, it's actually technically part of our theology as Nazarenes. Um, and so you need to, you know, there, there's some part of me that goes, I don't ever want to just tell somebody they shouldn't become a preacher in the church of the Nazarene or don't necessarily want to tell people you need to go somewhere else. But the fact is, if you cannot be in theological agreement with the church of the Nazarene, you don't need to be a preacher in the church of the Nazarene. Right? I mean, if you want to run your McDonald's the way O'Charlie's runs in O'Charlie's, you ought to go be a manager at O'Charlie's. Not running a McDonald's, right? Yep. If you want to run your Nazarene church on the theology of the Pentecostal churches of America, then you probably ought to go be a Pentecostal preacher and not a Nazarene preacher, okay? Um, and by the way, you're asked, uh, you're required in the process of becoming ordained church manager, becoming district licensed for that matter, to uh, sign on the dotted line that you're in agreement with our doctrine and policy. Uh, I, for one, take that seriously and encourage you to. I try really hard to uh, not make promises I don't mean or take oaths that I don't absolutely uh, intend to keep. So, you sign on the dotted line, mean it. Live by it. If you can't, then don't sign on the dotted line, and we can love you, and we can be brothers in Christ, but we're going to have to we're going to have to agree to disagree agreeably. <laughs> um, chapter 18. Um, we're going to move through. We're just going to kind of skip over, if you want to put it that way. We discussed wisdom literature in an earlier unit, and I don't see the need to just sort of review it in summary here. Um, chapter or lesson 19 speaks about eschatology, future hope, the doctrine of the last things. So eschatology, this big nasty word eschatology, is the doctrine of the last things. Describes the goal of God's saving purposes for his creation. It defines the believer's hope. What they confidently expect God will do in the future. Uh, the term eschatology coined in the 19th century traditionally treats topics associated in scripture with the end of the world. These topics include the coming of the Messiah, the kingdom of God, the resurrection of the dead, eternal life, the age of the spirit, final judgment, etc. Um, early Christians believed that they were living in the day of fulfillment. The prophetic promises of the Old Testament were realized in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and in his gift to the Church of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's easy to understand how um, those first century Christians really thought they were living in the last days, and they were. Got it? There's a sense, there's a real sense in which uh, we have been waiting for uh, the end since Jesus ascended. And since Jesus came, I think if you were to somehow be able to see this in an eternal perspective, I believe we, we would agree that we're living in the last days. The question is, how long are the last days going to be? Well, they've been 2,000 years or so, so far, and they may continue for a lot longer than any of us may like. Right? Um, they may not. My eschatology is uh, technically known as pan-millennialism. I probably am technically an amillennialist, just in case anybody just asked, no, you can look up what that means. Uh, I really what, 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 what was it? 
Pan- oh, Panelism? Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you the, the rest of it. Yeah, technically, theologically, I'm an all millennialist. I believe that the millennial reign spoken of in the book of Revelation is a metaphor for the kingdom of God that is both present in the world now and will be more fully present in the age to come after the second coming of Christ. Um, in other words, I don't subscribe to some interpretation of either the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, parts of Matthew, or Revelation, or the Revelation, the Apocalypse of John in the New Testament, that causes me to think that you ought to be trying to figure out formulas and timelines and and the signs of the time at the end and all of that. I just, my interpretation, my interpretive method doesn't hold that those are predictive prophecy of the end of time. They are something else. They speak the word of God for the people of God that they were given to, and they continue to speak the word of God to the people of God in the here and now. And if the Lord tarries, they will speak the word of God to the people of God heretofore. Right, the, the people that come after us. Because the word of God does that. It speaks the word of God to the people of God at every age that it's allowed to speak. But I thought that we were very clearly told the time and day when you won't know. Well, some people conveniently forget that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's the thing that was being raised Catholic. That was the thing that was or if, or if you're Knutson, and I've got I've got a box in my attic of actually I've got two boxes in my three boxes in my attic. anyway there was a time in my life when I collected all those kinds of books on predictive prophecy and I've got um, 87 reasons why the Lord will return in 1987 which was published in 1986 <laughs> or is it no I'm sorry 88 reasons why the Lord will return in 1988 which was published in 1987 and then I've got uh, its sequel. 89 reasons why the Lord will return in 1989, which was published in 1988 after the Lord didn't return in 1988. And the author realized that he had made a mistake and added the 89th reason. There wasn't a 19, there wasn't a 90 reasons why the Lord will return in 1990, because I think maybe somebody figured out that he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, Maybe he figured out he didn't know what he was talking about. But that author began with the premise that the Greek that Jesus used in the New Testament to say no man can know the hour meant nobody can know intuitively, but it meant you could figure it out. To which I went, well, there's a guy who has a lot of Greek hours in college learning New Testament Greek. I've never encountered anything that made me believe that that was an erroneous interpretation into English and that the Greek meant anything other than Jesus meant it is not for you to know the day, the hour, and that that's for God to know and nobody else, not even him, however that works, right? But beyond all of the, I don't know, almost comic banter that can occur around the various interpretive methods that have produced timelines and formulas and dates and there is a real hope for the future for Christians and one of the things that I don't ever want you to do um, a mistake I don't ever want you to make is to somehow minimize the Christian hope for the hereafter And I understand N.T. Wright's surprised by hope. I understand that we don't need a pie in the sky by and by religion. We need a religion that reaches into the future and drags that goodness into our present age. And Jesus did that, and the scriptures speak clearly to the idea that the goal of God in salvation is nothing short of the total recreation of the created order so that it is rightly related to God and filled with humans that are rightly related to each other and to him and to the created order. The whole new heaven and new earth, that beautiful picture that we get, um, however we choose to interpret the book of Revelation and all of the other eschatological passages in the scriptures, um, we, 
we cannot short sell the power of the hope that there is a day coming when evil will be finally and ultimately and eternally defeated and God will reign in the created order as he does in heaven. And that we will be changed. We will be resurrected. We will have new bodies that are incorruptible. We will have um, souls that are tuned to God and we will live forever with God in that new order. And that's a hope worth preaching about at least every once in a while and not just at funerals. There is some part of me that goes, I could just almost get all whooped up into a, a frenzy over the hope that we have in the future and the way in particular that we ought to celebrate that on Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> that beautiful, powerful Resurrection Sunday. And by the way, all Sundays are Resurrection Sundays, right? All Sundays are a celebration of the Resurrection. That's why we worship on Sundays and not Saturdays anymore. Even in the season of Lent, for those of us who are not liturgically trained, uh, in Sundays are feast days, not fast days. The rules of fasting and formal liturgical observance are actually suspended on Sundays because they're feast days, not fast days. That powerful res image of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it testifies to, that vibrant hope that is ours because Jesus defeated death in the grave and demonstrated that once for all, as surely as he forgives sins, he will overcome death and the grave. So the death, so the death is no longer the final word in the human condition. But for those who have been born again, life forever with Christ is the final word. And that's good news. The body that gets old and breaks down in the world that's getting older and breaking down and has been a long time, the vibrant hope that we have in Jesus Christ for a future where God's presence rules, where the kingdom is manifest even in the natural order because it has been recreated. Not just a soul has been recreated in the image of God, but the whole of the universe has been recreated in the way God would have it to be. The new heaven and the new earth. Um, the line that they have in, in the guide, it says, no one leaves this world alive. We are all terminal. We simply do not know how long we have in the hospice we call earthly life. But do we live with the vibrant hope while we are alive? I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff right there. That's right, and that's what I mean by that. We, we need to be a people who are at least future-directed enough. You know, again, let's not be so heavenly-minded that we're no earthly good, but let's be heavenly-minded enough that we reach over into that future reality and drag that goodness of the future kingdom of God back into the here and now. One of the things that I used, to, for me anyway, I used to get, hung up on trying to be good enough and I know I can never be good enough right but I can still be good I can still work you can be good and you can get better be more more better than I was absolutely I use a one percent method every day I try and be one percent better yeah tone that ambition down brother it's gonna take you more than 100 days <laughs> I got a lot to get better though. <laughs> One percent a day in a hundred days will have you at a perfection rate, which will move us right on in. That's only for one of the defects. <laughs> Quite frankly, it'll move us right on in to chapter twenty. <laughs> what? Move us right on into lesson twenty and the way to perfect life which might should be um, 
a lesson that strives to help you understand the biblical words that are used and translated perfect or perfection and, and not let an inappropriate um, philosophical understanding of perfection uh, be the norm for how you understand biblical passages that speak to us being perfect is our God is perfect. Um, you know, Jesus tells his disciples, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Sorry, every once in a while, I, the King James, just open my mouth and King James jumps out. That's because that's the way Paul wrote it. Oh, Paul didn't even write that, did he? That was <laughs> someone else in the gospel. Um, uh, we all heard it. <laughs> anyway, um, that's enough of that. But, you know, there is this injunction, and it sounds it sounds impossible to the Western mind whose only concept of the use of the word perfect is absolutely without flaw to the maximum potential theoretical possibility nth degree perfection. Um, chapter 20 is going to talk a lot about the different words used in the Old Testament. Uh, Ham, Shalem, as we get Shalom. Um, in the New Testament, Akribos and Telios. Katartidzo, okay? You got to love that one. Um, there's may or may not properly be translated perfection. But I'm going to just take you right to the word um, teleos. Because I think you need to understand that the word mostly used for perfection is teleos and its cognates. Um, and it implies a completeness. Um, it implies a fitness for purpose. Sometimes could be translated maturity or completeness. Um, but again, the idea of being fit for a purpose, that something is telia, something is teleologically perfect when it serves the function for which it was intended. Okay? Um, I just happen to have this little object lesson, this little busy water bottle right here. Is this a perfect bottle? The answer is, if by perfect you mean the Greek, philosophical, absolute, no flaw, cannot be improved upon idea of perfection, no. I think there are all kinds of ways in which we could improve this bottle. First of all, we can make it out of something that wasn't plastic didn't use up natural resources. Could we make a bottle that didn't use natural resources or at least transform them? Hard to know. Or at least was 100% recyclable and reclaimable and reusable, blah, blah, blah. We could come up with ways we could improve this bottle. But teleologically speaking, this is a perfect bottle because it does the job a bottle is supposed to do, right? It is fit for its intended purpose. It does its job. A human being is teleologically perfect when they do what their maker intended for them to do. And in that sense, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect doesn't mean absolute unimprovable perfection. It means something like love God with your whole heart. Do you see that jump in interpretation? What did okay. God intend for us to do? Ultimately, what was his intention for you? That we would return to him the love with which he had loved us. That we would willfully choose to make him the object of our affection. That we would will to will the will of God. Direct our whole being, right, toward God. 
teleological perfection. When you read, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. I, that's what I want you to think. That's the concept of biblical perfection or completeness. And I want you to think about it. We should be doing, we should be accomplishing what God made us to accomplish. We should be doing what God made us to do. Alan, are you frowning at me? Okay. Nope, I'm concentrating. Okay. There's three things that look like concentration. Concentration is one of them. <laughs> Deer in the headlight is another. <laughs> Confusion is another, yeah. <laughs> Constipation may be a third one. <laughs> We're not nope, going to go nope. further with that one. It was just concentration. Concentration, that's good. <laughs> Teleological perfection. Um, you just need. I just feel like you need that. That understanding, and and the process of that is ongoing, right? This is one of those things that I so very often have heard people, especially in Nazarene circles, and more so twenty years ago than today really struggle with our concept of scriptural holiness or the doctrine of entire sanctification and the battle that went on 20 years ago it was so hot and heavy the battle between the american holiness movement and the wesleyan holiness movement and the event versus the progression and the second work of grace versus an ongoing work of grace and there's a part of me that goes let's quit fighting about that stupid stuff and understand that it's moment and process. <clears throat> Sanctification is both process and momentary. We have milestones along the way. Those of you who've had investigating Christian theology, we, we have milestones along the way and it is right to use the word um, perfect or entire um, of that process of perfection when, as Wesley would say, one becomes, um, one's heart develops or has or comes into the expression of perfect love for God. Yeah. That, that absolute devotion. And that, again, is not a work of our own. Remember, we're not Pelagian and we never are anywhere along the continuum of salvation. We're never Pelagian. We're never about our own ability. We're always about grace, God, Holy Spirit enabled human beings, right? The best Christian you've ever met in your life was a grace enabled human being. It was, they were not a great person. They were a grace enabled person and that made them great. No, I was sitting there, you were using the bottle as an example for perfect. And I was having a conversation with somebody earlier this week about entire sanctification and Christian perfection and all that. They're like, I don't think I could ever be entirely sanctified, you know, and it's like, OK, you know, it, it's it's a process, you know, it's it's like you say, there's milestones, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's right. And there should be. I mean, this is, you know, ultimately this is the doctrine of entire sanctification. There should be a moment when you get to that stage, when your heart is intentionally directed towards God, when you are wholly surrendered to God and wholly with a W and not just an H, right? Yeah. 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 And it's, it's the word entire they get caught on. That's right. So. I mean... And, and the same way with the word perfection in Scripture, mm -hmm. we don't have, we're not equipped with that ability to talk about teleological perfection, perfection of intention, perfection of function. Um, we're going to have trouble. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've often uh, this is another one of those things I've often heard, and in, in within the right context, I understand what it means. But you know, 
I've heard the expression, you know, the the standard is is God. God's holiness is the standard. Um, and we can never achieve God's holiness. And so that's why we've got to have grace. Well, no, God's holiness is not the standard. <laughs> Stop and think about it. What God intended for the human being to be is the standard. It just so happens that he intended for human beings to be in right relationship with him. He created us in right relationship with him. We were supposed to be responding to him in all of our creatureliness with the love that we are supposed to have for our creator. Which is why people say to be more Christ-like. That's right. Be more Christ-like. Be more Christ-like. Be absolutely as, as much like Jesus as you can be, Jesus is as much of God as will fit in human form, right? But if you think about it, I, I don't know, I've just heard these weird statements. God's holiness has never, I mean, I understand what they mean by it, but God's holiness has never been the standard, except as it is God's intention for us to bear the image of God and to respond to him in love. And I just say, go go back to the Garden of Eden. I hope that y'all are understanding what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be heretical. And there are people who use that kind of language. And when you listen to them, explain it. They mean, I think, what I'm trying to say. And that is, we are supposed to strive to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, our whole being. We are supposed to respond in love and obedience to his commandments and his will. And the great commandment to love uh, one another is... is you've been loved, right? I mean, to love each other and to love God the way Christ has loved us. Um, but Adam was still a creature. Adam in the Garden of Eden before the fall, in, in, in Adam's quote-unquote perfect state, he was still a creature. And he had creaturely failings. I just can't help but think that he didn't have total recall. Maybe he did. And his body got tired and he had to go to sleep. At least I think he did. And I think there are, I think he couldn't be everywhere at one time. And so he had to be at one place and not be at another. And therefore he had to do what he could do in the place where he was and not do something else in another place, even though it might need to be done. <laughs> right? He was still a creature. And I've just, I've heard too many sermons which try to elaborate on the idea of Christian perfection in weird, crazy terms that would deny our creatureliness. And there is just some part of me that goes, I think part of being perfect the way God wants us to be perfect is to embrace our place as a creature. Especially in understanding how that understanding puts us in the, the right place to respond to our creator as a creature rightly should. So very often, I mean, it's the story of the fall of Satan. It's the story of the fall of humanity. When we get to thinking we don't need to be creatures and we need to be godly, <laughs> but not, not godly as in how we think and behave and all, but we need to be more you know, like God, of equal standing with him. That's when we get into trouble. When we stop thinking we ought to be creatures who love God and respond to God in love, it becomes uh, all messed up like our world is today. It just there is uh, what are you the right crowd for me to use this line on? I'm going to experiment with you and see. It's going to be recorded so somebody can watch it later on and burn me at the stake for it. But there's this scene in I'm trying to remember which one of the Avengers movie. I think it may be just the Avengers when Loki is uh, in Germany and he says 
um, isn't this better? He tells everybody mm -hmm. to kneel. He says, isn't this better? Now, I'm here to free you of the fantasy or however he says it, of freedom. Mm -hmm. You were created to be ruled. And, and there's just a part of me that goes, there is so much truth in that speech. It's just it needs to be Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives in glory saying that. Right? We were created to be ruled by God. We were created not to be free for our own purposes, but free for God's purposes, which is like slaves to God's purposes, but it's the best freedom we could ever know. Right. Well, we, we when we were created, if we go back to Genesis one, he said he created us so that we could take care of his world for True. him. <laughs> True image, and he put the man in the garden so he could till it and keep it. That's exactly. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to move into chapter twenty one. I'm we were listening. <laughs> Uh, 21, um, our commitment to compassion. Um, this is another one of those where I'm going, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that this has been mentioned throughout this course in various ways, um, and maybe it hadn't been caught, so I'm just going to make a couple of things explicit. One, um, we are required. Right. I mean, this is just y'all hear this. Everybody hear this. The biblical narrative requires us to love others the way God has loved us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to say that and about our commitment to compassion. Uh, we love others because God has loved us. We respond. We are changed creatures so that we respond to others differently. Um, Paul says we can't consider um, people like we used to from a human point of view. Uh, when I preach on that passage in the Corinthian correspondence, I, I say, What's the human point of view? The human point of view is how can I use you? Mm -hmm. That's the natural human point of view is, is always how can I use everything to my benefit? And he says when you become a Christian, when you follow Jesus, you can no longer look at people and say, how can I use you for my purposes? No matter how high and lofty they are, by the way, don't ever let your role as a minister um, uh, allow you to justify using other people for your own ends just because they somehow seem godly or something, okay? You, you, let's just not even go there on that discussion because I'll get aggravated. Y'all have enough context and knowledge and experience to know whereof I speak. Or at least make up your own scenarios and know where I speak. You can't use people for your own purposes. We have to view people from God's point of view, who, who, oh, Jesus was God, didn't think it was something he could grasp and hold on to or had to hold on to, but he could become a servant. He could give himself for us, you know. He no longer looks to other people for how he can use them. I mean, Christ never looked at people that way, right? He actually looked at himself and said, how can I use me for them? That's the radical mindset that the gospel calls us to. People can make up all kinds of fancy words and programs and call it social justice and they can do all, I mean, but... In case you hadn't heard me say, I, I just I'm I don't I'm I'm almost militantly against the use of that term. Because the last thing in the world I want to get or give is justice. But I sure like to receive mercy and I sure know I must be compassionate.
that'll move us to lesson 22, where we're, we have talked long and hard about how evil entered creation. And that story and how uh, evil does not appear as a result of the creative act of God. Um, and so I, I'm, it's another one of those difficult concepts that I, I want you to just, I'm going to babble for a minute and then we're going to talk a minute and we're almost done actually. Um, it's very important when you think of evil to think of what is not as opposed to what is. Okay. Evil. Um, how do I I'm trying to think about how I say this without being, so I'm just going to be technical and back into it. Okay. Evil is not an existentially positive category. Okay. That made sense to everybody. I could see by the wonderful expressions of understanding that everybody got on their faces that I just <laughs> successfully communicated that with everybody. So I'm going to back up and take another run of it. I'm going to keep bumping into that wall until I succeed, okay? Um, when God created the heavens and the earth, when God created the man and the woman, we have existentially positive beings. We really exist in the real world. We are created and we're good. But evil doesn't have, quote unquote, being, right? It's not something God created. Instead, evil arises or evil, if you want to say, is where good is not. It's an absence. It's a perversion. It's a non-being. Okay? Instead of being a creative force, it's a destructive force. Um, and in, in so many ways, um, somehow having this kind of, I mean, you're familiar with the, with the, if I say the word dualism, are you familiar with what that means sort of philosophically that some religions or some philosophies are dualistic? And by that, both evil and good exist in some kind of balance. Right? Taoism in particular with the yin and the yang and the picture of the, the little swish of black and the little swish of white and how one is bad and one is good, but they exist together and they're the same size. They're always depicted that way because it's understood that the good balances the evil and the evil balance and they are in balance. It's a dualistic understanding. Christianity is not dualistic. We do not believe in two equally powerful opposites, a, a God on his throne in heaven and a Satan on his throne in hell, battling it out for eternity as equal opposites. That's absolutely not Christian, right? Christian is God is all powerful, the good, creator is the ruler of the universe of all things seen and unseen and evil is where that good is not if we were just explode our understanding of satan and we have to be really careful really careful not to be miltonians but to be christians not that Milton wasn't a Christian, but it's very hard in the Western world for us to talk about Satan and the 
the battle in heaven or whatever without lending more credence to Milton's Paradise Lost than biblical stories. And the Bible doesn't spend a whole lot of time explaining Satan. There's very little, little snippets here and there. But they all suggest what Milton really elaborates in a fictional form, but they suggest that evil and the Satan occurs because he sets his will against the will of God and he wants to become equal to God. And when that happens, it's the perversion of the good. Satan, the, the bright morning star, right? Lucifer, the, the bright one, the brilliant one. Really scary. You know, my imaginary friend when I was a little boy before about age five was named Brilliant, which could actually be a synonym for Satan or for Lucifer. It's just really scary. I try not to think about it. I'm glad Brilliant left me a long time ago, okay? Yeah. Don't go too far with that one. It scares me enough, so. Um, <laughs> but that Brilliant one, that bright one, a shining one ceased to be the shining one when he ceased doing and being what God intended for him to be. And he set himself in opposition to God. So it's a perversion. God didn't make the evil one evil. He made the evil one good. And the evil one became evil by choosing to be something other than what God made him to be. Sin, think about sin, right? Sin enters our world and our description of sin, it's just, it's so wonderful and quite frankly telling and full of theological and uh, even rhetorical fruit that we can uh, talk about sin, the very first sin, as consuming fruit, eating. It's absolutely essential for life that we eat. Right? Remember God said of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat except one. Yeah. Right? Again, God's first a provider and then a protector. And, and so the whole idea that it's the perversion, right? It's the reaching out and taking what we were not meant to take. It's the doing what we were not meant to do. It's the choosing other than the will of God that brings sin and evil into the world. And even in the spiritual realm, it's the same kind of concept around Satan that by setting his will against God, setting himself up to be equal with God, striving to be equal with God, he fell as a spiritual being and some evil, you know, what we now call demons um, with him. And it's just so hard to, uh, it's really hard to dig very deep into that. I mean, there's some scripture that talks about it, but we dig very hard and we end up in the Milton's universe instead of the biblical universe. Um, and what I'm striving to get across here is this idea that evil doesn't kind of have a life of its own. It's not out there existing on its own, but that it arises where the good is perverted. It arises where the good doesn't, that God intended, that God made, is thwarted or misused or rejected. Um Maybe this little analogy helps, right? You're in a dark closet. Y'all never did that. Y'all never played that game when you were a little boy. Um, you're in a dark closet and you have a little flashlight. When you shine the light in the closet, the flashlight, you turn it on. It's like the whole closet lights up. That's because light 
as positive being. It's existentially positive. It fills up the void that is the darkness. It literally beats itself into the darkness and, and causes it to be full. Turn the light off, and now there isn't darkness which is invading the light. There's just darkness because the light's not shining anymore. That's evil. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I'm trying to communicate about evil. When the, the good that God intended is thwarted, bypassed, goes away, it's not that evil kind of goes rushing in like a positive force, like it's the, you know, the darkness to the light. It's the light's just not shining anymore. So the goodness of God isn't happening anymore. So evil is where there's the absence of that good. Lucifer was a being that was created by God. That's right. So evil, just knowing that, evil cannot exist on its own. Only right. can exist on its own. That's right. Right. We're, so we're not dualists. You know, that got to say that. Keep it from That's me. Right. Dualists. Right. And it, God can exist on his own. Right. Evil can't be everywhere on its own. That's right. And exist on its own. That's right. So it can't infiltrate on good. We have to allow it. That's right. To, to enter. And and we have to remove the goodness of God in order for it to quote unquote move in. And it doesn't really, you know. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think you're headed the right way. I think we're working it out. That's right. Yeah, I don't know where I heard it, but I was in some kind of a study and they were talking about that he was a created being. And right. that really cleared a lot for me because he can't just be everywhere. And he was created good. He was created good. And he made the choice. That's right. Oh. That's right. And so some things that that... Um, some things that that enables for us theologically is goodness can exist without evil. Evil is not a necessity in our universe. Mm -mm. There really is a future where there is a new heaven and a new earth and all of the old has passed away. All of the evil is gone. There is no night. <laughs> think, think about the promises, right? kind of embedded in that, in the new heaven and the new earth. And there is no night, and there is no star, stars, and there is no sun, and there is no moon. Because... Goodness is light. Yeah, because the Son of God, <laughs> right? God himself, really, the presence of God himself is their light. Just, and there is no night. There, you know. The other thing is they're in there. Yeah, old things have passed away. And because evil doesn't have its own positive existence, not existentially positive. In the end, of course, God can overcome it, but not only can God overcome it, God can eternally suppress it or destroy it, which is what we believe in the eschaton, in the end of days, in the return of the Son of God to end time and usher in the new age will happen, is that evil will be destroyed. Um, how do we overcome evil? By doing good. Um, and Steve, I, I understand what you mean. I understand the need to resist, but I'm going to play on this idea for just a minute because it's an important point, I think, is that I think when we're dealing with new Christians, when we're dealing with converts from bad ways, you know, from, as it were, evil ways of life, 
sinful ways of living, I think that it's it's somewhat important to help them to understand that the goal is not to fight against doing evil. So the goal is not to spend your days trying not to sin. Because if that's what your brain is concentrated on, think about what you're going to be doing all the time. You're going to be giving power to that which is not. You're going to be giving force to the evil because you're putting your effort into striving to do, striving to not do what you're not supposed to do. There's just so little power there. I would actually say there's something like anti-power there. And over and over and over again, people who get concentrated on that kind of mindset, the preacher that starts preaching against prostitution and railing against prostitution and goes on a campaign in his community, community against prostitution and is the, the, the head guy in the lynch mob trying to get the prostitute hung up and is, you know, down at the jailhouse. Uh, he's the one that ends up in bed with the prostitute. Because what's he done with all of his mental and spiritual energy is he's, he's directed it at that evil. And he's literally empowered the unempowered. <laughs> he's given strength to the weakness. I think one of the things that in what I deal with on a, on a, on a weekly, daily and weekly basis with the guys is that they're, and I hate to give any any strength to this, but they're fighting demons. No, I okay. Yeah. Demons that they had for years and years, and you know I tell them all the time, you need to rebuke them because they're they're talking to them. <laughs> well, and and that's a little bit different place to go, but so there's just a part of me that goes. Let me come back to the demon thing there, and and I understand that's both that could be both literal and figurative, okay? Yeah. The demons they're fighting could be both literal and figurative, mm -hmm. but there's just part of me that goes, we need to teach people to strive to do good. Yes. To keep the commandments. I agree with that. To take up their cross and follow Jesus. You know, to love. You know, to keep the eleventh commandment. New commandment I give you. Some of these guys, and, and I'd love to have more conversation with you offline on this, because yeah. some of these guys are, you know, me included, was God had his side of the street and I had mine. I didn't want to hear about following the commandments and all that kind of stuff. I had no relationship. Yeah. And so all I knew was the dark side. And I had to have somebody drag me kicking and screaming to God. Well, and and so I hope that there's some power to in your mind to what I'm saying, and that is there you is. spend your energy fighting the evil. You got to spend your energy embracing the good. Yep. And, yeah. And that's why I want to share, and, and not on this conversation, yep. but I'm just going to say this. I want to share some of the things that I do at my meetings and get your input as to the direction I'm going. Yeah. Because I focus on the good. I focus all night on the good. Yeah. And then when it comes to the literal and figurative demons, um, habits, right? Bad habits mm -hmm. are hard to break. Habits, habits in general are hard to break. But the best way to break a bad habit is to replace it with a good habit. Absolutely. You know? What is it? Uh, I talked to a guy one time who said, you know, I don't say the blessing before I eat. I wait until afterwards. I said, cool. That's pretty Hebrew, you know, pretty, pretty Israelite of you. Sure. <laughs> um, not that they always do that, but they could. It was, it's not an unusual tradition to give thanks after a meal. But he said, but I said, so why do you do that? And he said, because I used to always smoke a cigarette after I ate. <laughs> and I found myself, 
I'd finish supper and think, I'm going to go sit on the back porch and smoke a cigarette. So instead of doing that, I'd go kneel by my bed and thank God for everything I'd had that day, including the meal I just enjoyed. He just, he literally replaced a bad habit with a good habit. Yeah. It's just a silly example, maybe, but that's, I just think that there's power in the good habits. And at the end of the day, what is it that separates the, the spiral of self-destruction of addictive and self-destructive behavior, which destroys you and the people around you and leads so many people to depression and suicide. What's the difference in that lifestyle and the one we're offering is we're saying instead of spiraling down by giving all that energy to all those bad things, we want, as it were, you to spiral up yeah. by giving energy to the good things. Right. Have you uh, read the book uh, by N.T. Wright, uh, After You Believe? I have not. I've heard of it. I've not read it. I've read his uh, Surprised by Hope. Okay. Yeah. After You Believe, I've read it, I don't know, three, four times, something like that. But he talks about habits in there. Really good. Yeah. I, I'm a, in case I didn't tip my hat hard enough, I'm a firm believer in holy habits. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to leave you all with this little little bit at the end, okay? Avoid evil. And, um, for a while, for almost a year, I worked on a series of sermons and teachings around the idea of skills and tools. Tools and skills. And the, the core of, of that whole thought process for me was... If you were to go back in time in, in the Christian era, you were to go back in time 100 years, maybe even 50 years, but at this point, let's say 100, uh, into the power days of the Christian movement, right? Or even 200 or 300 or 40, when, when, you know, when men were men and women were women and fire came down from heaven when we prayed. Yeah. Or at least it felt like there were those days. And, and I think on some sort of mass scale, there was a time when the Christian movement in the West in particular, maybe not worldwide. The fact of the matter is, is that Christ, the Christian movement, the Christian religion has never been stronger than it is today on a global scale. And sometimes we, we lose, you know, because we get all excited, we read the New Testament and say, and 3,000 were added to their number that day. Well, you ought to see if you can't figure out how many tens of thousands were saved today. I mean, it's the problem is it's not happening in the West and it's not happening in modern North America, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of people are coming to Christ today. <laughs> um, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, I, we, we just need a little more of it here. Yeah. So so what have we lost? And, and this is just it. So I, I'm a woodworker and this is just kind of a James analogy. I, I love to work wood. And I've kind of gotten into hand tools, old hand tools. Um, not that I'm exclusively a hand tool guy. I use hand tools. I'm, a, I'm technically a hybrid method woodworker. I want to use hand tools for what they're really best at. And I want to use power tools where they make sense for efficiency. And um, So when my dad died, five years ago Tuesday, I inherited from him his toolbox, his old toolbox full of hand saws and a, some chisels and a bit and brace and a couple of hand planes. It didn't take me long to realize that one or two of those items were contemporary to him and the rest were really his dad's. You know, like the hand plane that was from the 1930s. Well, dad was born in 31. He wasn't doing much hand planing at the age of three, <laughs> four or five or six. Okay. It was his dad's hand plane. That number five Stanley that I've got in working order now came from his dad. I got it. And I had some vague notion about what it could do and should, should do. I had a little better notion on the hand saws because dad taught me to use saws and taught me to sharpen hand saws. So I'm a real rare bird in that sense. I was actually taught 
by the old school method how to use hand files to sharpen hand saws. Yay, Ra, you don't need to know that probably, but it's a cool fact. But I start digging into hand planes because I think hand planes could have a real place in some of my woodwork and finish and save me a lot of work in some circumstances. So I went on this like year plus, I'm still probably learning some of it, learning all about the hand plane, learning about what it's for and how to use it, and in particular, how to sharpen it and how to tune it, um, how to, you know. And what I realized was here is a here is a tool and a whole world of skills that I don't have to make this tool function. Because the old masters, you go back in time 500 years prior to the Industrial Revolution and any kind of power tools. And have you seen pictures of those churches and palaces? Mm -hmm. All of that stuff was done by hand. That furniture was made without any kind of power tool. Yep. And it's beautiful and it's like smooth, like glass finish kind of stuff. And they did that with these quote unquote primitive tools. But the power of the tool were in all, and it, it's not just a skill, but all of the skills related to how to use it. Bring that to the spiritual world. How long does it take? How many, how many generations does it take for the knowledge of the tool and the skills to be lost? The answer is one. All you have to have is a parent generation not pass on to the child generation. The tools and the skills. And that whole way of being able to do something is lost. Now, it may have been replaced by something better, but it may not have been. And there's a part of me that goes, how come we talk about a generation or two ago when people got on their knees and got before God and the heavens came down. And, and my, ex, my argument would be they had tools and skills that we've lost. Our grandparents passed them to our parents, but our parents got hippified and didn't pass them to us. Well, in my case, I skipped the hippie generation because of the age of my parents. I'm, a, I'm an afterthought, as it were, or, or an after plan according to my mom. So do you, you understand where I'm going there? Yeah, yeah. See, grandmama knew how to get on her knees and how to stay on her knees until she got in touch with God. And, and, and it didn't take her all day. You know what I'm saying? It, I sometimes hear people, we're going to stay here to look, you know. Go. It's like, well, you know, you read about it, and there were times when that was kind of happening every Sunday. Well, you didn't have to whoop it up for a week to make it happen on Sunday, right? You, tools and skills. Tools and skills. What have we lost? We've lost those skills. Uh, and maybe you have it in this room. Maybe I have it. But by and large, our people have lost those skills of listening to the voice of God, of following up those holy habits. All of those things are what I call tools and skills. Things you have and knowing how to use them. Prayer is a tool that connects us with God. Skills, knowing how to pray, when to pray, how to listen. That prayer is a two-way street, not a one-way street. Learning the skills of being in some sort of uh, perpetual prayer, a life, a mind, a thought life that's just directed toward God all the time so that we're not self-directed or world-directed. We're We've got this like background conversation going on with God all the time. Well, I think that sometimes I was reading in some of the literature earlier that we've been numbed the second yeah. because of the, the years that have passed. Yeah. Our society has been numbed to the fact that of the second coming. Yeah. And, yeah. I'll tell you what I really think, but. I think I'll that's to that. <laughs> okay. Um, I get it, but who numbed us? It wasn't the world. No. Mm -hmm. 
the people that numbed us to the second, the power of the second coming were Christians who were teaching that they could predict the second coming. Right. Who were who were artificially inducing a level of urgency that was not fulfilled. Right. 88 reasons why the Lord's coming back in 88. There's a lot of disappointed people when it didn't happen. Well, there's at least one disappointed person when it didn't happen. <laughs> He's so disappointed he wrote a second book, right? I mean, yep. you get what I, but you got to hold up. I mean, remember, I mean, I remember in 76 sitting in the Nazarene church watching the first motion picture I'd ever seen, The Years of the Beast. Scary stuff. It was like, you know, left behind before left behind. And and trust me, that wasn't the first one. You know, how Lindsay and the late great planet Earth and that whole movement that just basically whipped the Christian world, the evangelical West, into a frenzy over the end of times and the nuclear threat and how that was all. I mean, and then it's just not the case. And what happened in that expectation, loss of expectation, I think, was this, that we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. By and large, a lot of Christians realize we need to let this predictive prophecy mess go. We need to quit with this formulas and timelines, and we need to we need to let that go. But I'm afraid that we very much let too much of it go, because we should not ever let go of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ for the future. We can't let go of that future hope, and we can't let go of the urgency of living in the last days. And not the urgency of, I don't need to pay my mortgage off because the Lord's going to return, you know, two months, six days, and five hours and 42 seconds from now. It's the urgency of when the Lord returns, nobody else gets saved. Right. Yep. Nobody gets saved. Once, once eternity begins, once once the great end of time comes, nobody gets saved after that. People only get saved in time. People only come to Christ in, in, in the present time. Are we on God's mission or not? Yep. And that urgency of living into that future, of seeing people saved, of living Christ-like examples, of becoming more like Jesus, and, and quite frankly, of realizing what is so hard for people to realize in our world, although the coronavirus might actually help this a little bit, and that is that we all going to die. Mm. Right? I mean, nobody's getting out of this world alive, is what they say, unless you're alive when he returns, and then you translate it, however that works out. But you understand what I'm saying, that there is this urgency. We're not promised tomorrow. Live, live for Jesus today. Yep. When you, if you throw all of that future stuff out because you, you, you get tired of hearing about, you know, May 22nd at 4 a.m., it's going to be zap and the rapture is going to happen or whatever that's going to be, and then it doesn't. That doesn't mean doesn't mean when you die you're not going to meet your maker. Right. What I tell people is, um, it's far more important to be ready for the end of time than to know when the end is going to be. Live ready. <laughs> Odds are, this just James, you know, speaking from a historian. You know, if history is a predictor, if if history is the best predictor of future success, then odds are your end will be before the big end. That will not make it any less momentous for you. So be ready. Live ready. Do God's good work in the present. Use today. Reach people with the gospel and the good news of Jesus. That's all we have is today. And uh, hopefully, as you do that, uh, we will be overcoming evil in our world. 
with goodness of God, we will see souls saved and sinners reclaimed and people moved on to entire sanctification and continue on the process of sanctification unto glorification and his kingdom will come and his kingdom will come and his kingdom will come heart by heart until he comes and his kingdom takes over the universe. There you go. Um, we have a mission. Blue's yeah. brother said it. We're on a mission from God. And the Bible is our source book. Rightly understood, it's our source book. Yeah. Not just for how people get saved, but to live. So it's important you, me, learn how to draw conclusions, interpret, and develop theology from our great source book. Thank you. It's been great to have you in class. You've been a good well, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Instruction. So you know that uh, you know that officially the deadline for work is next week. Yep. Um, I'm going to be real generous and say everybody gets an extra week. Jack, just because he's such a beautiful fella. <laughs> thank you, Jack. All right. Everybody else, because um, whether it's been spoken um, and it has been spoken by more than one, um, the truth is that the um, tornadoes in Nashville has affected people's availability and time, and and it's also affected how we work and, and the virus and all of that business plays into that. And don't get lazy, just. You have been told the the deadline is officially extended by a week. So. Thank you. Thank right. you, Pastor. See, guys, good. <laughs> that means nothing like the grace. Freely, freely, freely given. Freely given grace. Holy cow! Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. Well, God's blessing on you and your ministry. And continue to do good work. Bring thank his you. All right. Thank you, James. Thank you. Good night. Don't thank be you. Bye, guys. Hey, it's fine.